from Microbe TV. This is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 170, recorded on May 7th, 2019. Joining me today here in New York City, Dixon Despommier. Hello there, Vincent. And from a remote location, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everybody. Hello, Daniel. <laughs> How's everyone today? Well, chipper. Uh, behind me is a window. Not in Fargo, the sense of the word. However, looks uh, sunny out there. It's yeah. delightful. It's it's the the temperature is perfect. It's a little bit. Well, it's in the low 60s. I don't know. I, I've been here inside all day. Yeah, I know. I know. But uh, And we're both busy in end-of-stage um, coursework that's been going on, right? You're in your last week of courses, and I just finished yeah, submitting my final grades. I have a final on Monday. Right. And I have many students coming this week to talk about Indeed. things. By the way, Daniel, I'm still writing like crazy on the questions, so... As soon as we finish, we're going to give it to Vincent. If he passes the exam, we're going to leave it like that. <laughs> I, thought, I thought they were too hard. I, I know you did. And that, that, no, come on. These are – I'm making these very reasonable. They're all based on the slides, by the way. There's no mysteries about this at all. That, that's a kiwi. You're showing me a kiwi. I have a kiwi here on my desk. He does. Not, not a bird. He has a kiwi fruit. It says Italy. Do they really import these from Italy? Sure. They're all over the place now. California. Could we make this in a vertical farm? Uh-huh. That's a tree. Why would you want to do that? It comes off a tree, really? It does. Trees are outside. Right. Well, this is the wrong podcast, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, so I should say, like, what Dixit is talking about, you know, listeners are wondering what he's talking about, is we we now have our online course, sort of, for parasites, wow. um, where people can, not only can they read the book, which um, ep, I guess edition seven is now up for uh, free download. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and the Kindle is up for purchase on Amazon. Um, like, you know, so if you'd rather spend money versus get it for free, who knows? Um, <laughs> but we're, we're trying to create an examination so that people can go through this. And then if they want to be examined and get a sense, if they've reached a, a level of mastery, perhaps uh, a certificate would be, yeah, they'll, they'll go exactly. They'll go online. They'll take this. They'll pass it, hopefully, yes. and then they'll get a certificate, uh, basically showing that they've gone through this process and have reached this level of mastery. And as what I was saying is, I thought it was quite hard. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not easy writing these questions. It, it, but remember, I taught for thirty-eight years at a very high-quality medical school. So these are the kind of questions that we would ask second-year medical students to, and we would expect them to know the answers. But for a general readership. Uh, it it may the level might be a little bit above their pay grade as they would say, but I think most people reading and listening to these uh, episodes will be able to do quite well, especially if you <laughs> have the episode open near you as you're taking the exam. Yeah, that's, that, that occurred <laughs> to me. This is an open book exam. There's going to be um, uh, yeah. they will get a hundred if they do it that way, but um, it's it's it, we'll have to work out a technique for. You have to take this without aid of whatever. I don't, you know, I don't mind, like, because there is the issue that when you, as you're looking stuff up, you can learn as you're taking an exam. Well, that's the idea. So the, I like that. I like the, the idea, idea is that, to yeah. learn as you're taking the exam. That's exactly right. So the, the uh, according to Amazon, the seventh edition is not available. So that the Kindle should be available, right? But Let just the check. paperback. Because the because I will tell you that the paperback I'm having issues getting up on Amazon as a print ready. Just here we go. It's, it's huge. It is. I told seventh, you. Seventh edition Kindle two ninety nine, right? Yes. So, so for two dollars. So uh, I will okay. put I will put that on Parasites Without Borders. What what you got in your eye, Daniel? Huh. So let us uh, <laughs> remind people and then acquaint those for tuning in for the first time to the case that we discussed on the last TWIP. This was a nine-year-old boy who was brought into the mobile clinic that was set up in a small village in the Bocas del Toro archipelago. Um, he initially had a red painful eye a few months uh, prior that had lasted one to two weeks. Um, the eye now... Um, a couple months later, is no longer red, um, but he's coming in now because he has uh, issues with vision in, in that eye. And on eye exam, he has um, peripheral vision, um, but no clear vision. He, he cannot see things uh, sharply, so he has no sharp, clear vision. Uh, 
he is examined by an ophthalmologist, we actually have an ophthalmologist with us, and on his fundoscopic exam, uh, he notes that there's retinal retraction. He seems a quiet, He sees a quiet granuloma over the macula of the affected eye. And so we left people with a, a bunch of questions. What do they think is going on? Mm. Uh, and what are the different ways that this may have been approached or may be approached now? Cade writes, Hiya Twipsters. I am a marine biology grad student who rarely sees a non-Medusa zoan. What is that? It's a coral reef polyp. But I think I have an idea on this one. To me, given the age range of the patient and detachment granuloma symptoms, it seems that OLM, Toxocara cati canis, is a good bet. It is relatively common, but more usually in places where humans and pets, domesticated animals, intermingle freely. Treatment would likely mean surgery. So it's lucky that this team had a specialist to make the call on how to proceed. As for whether it could have been caught earlier, I would say that that is unlikely. Not only do a lot of things make a kid's I read and painful, but OLM doesn't test as accurately as VLM does. It, if it was diagnosed, there could have been a three-week albendazole treatment that could have helped, but may not have. Side note, in the S. bovis and S. hematobium paper, it is clear, is it clear, whether uncooked meats could cause a human to have both S. bo and S. he for hybridization? Ah, that's last week's paper. Uncooked meats. Hmm. You know, we talked about hybridization. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I remember the paper, but what does uncooked meats have to do with schistosomiasis? I, I think that's maybe you want to make a comment about that, Dixon? Well, so, you might be yeah. a little confused about this because I think um, you don't catch this parasite by eating it. So, yeah, I think that's I think that's important. So, yeah, so I wouldn't I, think you would have to worry mm, about getting schistosomiasis. You know what? That's, it's not a bad error to to make if you're a marine biologist, so I will forgive the error of quite easily and say that uh, right. eating meat that's got both in it doesn't really matter. Can we uh, tell us what OLM and VLM is? Ocular and visceral larva migraines. Larva migraines. Yeah, it's caused by the larval got form it. of, this is an ascarid of dogs and cats. Okay. And we've discussed this several times already. Dixon. Yes, Chris writes, hello, professors. It's a beautiful 72 and sunny here at Stony Brook today. It's been quite a while, but I'm finally getting some free time to catch up on the episodes. For the most recent case, I believe the parasite is Onchocercovolvulus. I wish I had time to discuss treatment and such, but more. But I'm short on time, so I will just leave it at that with my best guess. After your discussion about parasite global prevalence being over 50%, I figure you all might be interested in discussing this meta-analysis by Camilla, and he lists a reference to that. It says, which is just a fantastic paper in general. Also, I know Robert Poulin has several papers on the subject that could also be interesting to you in the subject of parasite diversity. Here is his page, and he's got another page, and he's at the University of Otago in New Zealand. It it may take a bit of time to find the relevant papers I'm referring to as this man publishes an insane amount. Another reason I'm writing today is because I'm, I moderate the subreddit for parasitology, and I have recently started a monthly journal club for us to discuss all things parasite, and I want to extend an invitation to all the listeners who are looking for more places slash people to discuss parasite papers with. We select a paper as a group every month and then have a discussion thread on the last Sunday of every month. It gives a reference to that. Anything related to parasitology is allowed from new papers on new anti-parasitic uh, drugs to parasite ecology. Lastly, if you have any desire to discuss bivalve parasitology slash immunology, my advisor, Basim Alem, is an expert in the field, and I think he could make a very interesting episode. Hard clams alone make up the largest fishery on Long Island and make up some $100 million industry on the East Coast. However, they are plagued by an opportunistic protozoan parasite, QPX, quahog parasite unknown. It is this one small aspect of bivalve disease, so I figured if you all wanted to talk about a different aspect of parasitology, let me know and I could get Basim in touch with you. Mm. All the best, Chris. Should we do this? That'd be great. Yeah, I like that, actually. I've, I just made uh, linguine with white sauce and clams. And uh, those clams <laughs> all come from the East Coast. 
And um, you didn't use quahogs for that. I didn't, but you know, if you look at the little necks, which I did use, and cherry stone clams, and just regular clams, those are all the same species at different sizes. Yeah, but quahogs would be too too big. Uh, they'd be enormous. Yeah, too yeah. big. I no, I quite agree. And yeah, the ones in Italy, vongole, we don't even have here. They're best, the small ones. The little tiny ones. Tiny. Oh, they're good. We don't get them here. Cockles come close to that, but not. Daniel. Yeah, I was going to ask. What is this Reddit? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, uh, it, Reddit is an online site where people go to. Uh, it stands have, for something, right? I don't know what it stands for, but it's it has <laughs> lots of divisions where people go and and chat. It's a chat room. It's a chat it's a room. Chat. It's a like an online blog or something. People well, post stuff, and then there's threads. Is that it's kind more of than the? That. It's, it's well, I wouldn't call it a blog. It's just it's a community community bulletin board where yeah. people. That's right. Um, I think Reddit stands for something close to that. People post all sorts of things, and there are subreddits like his parasitology. Okay. Everything you can imagine is here. Okay, everything. <laughs> right. Okay. And then so, and it's extreme, you get a lot of you get a lot of traffic. Yeah. Okay, and um, it's very popular with youth. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Let me read. Jacqueline writes, "Hello, Twipsters." I suspect the nine-year-old boy with uh, vision loss, retinal retraction, and a macular granuloma is suffering from ocular larva migraines caused by Toxicara canis. Differential diagnosis would include ocular larva migraines due to T. cati or retinoblastoma. Mm -hmm. My apologies for the very brief case guess. I'm currently preparing for USMLE step one, and sadly, there aren't fantastic podcasts like this one for every subject on the exam. (laughs) At least I know I can handle any parasitology questions that should come up. Cheers. Jacqueline DeVries, UCSD School of Medicine, class of 2021. What's USMLE? Um, when you're going through your training um, to become a physician, there actually are three step exams that you must pass if you are ever going to practice medicine in the United States. Mm-hmm. And so it's uh, level one, level two, and level three. Level one, you take usually after your second year's second year of medical school. Yep. Uh, step two, you take right at the end of finishing your right. medical school. Step three, you take after your first year of post medical school training. So after your intern year. Didn't they used to call them the boards or something like that? So these are different. So in addition to the USMLEs, it's now become pretty standard that if you want to practice in a lot of parts of the US, you have to also take a, a board exam in a particular specialty. I, mean, I didn't specialty mean that. Might but, okay, I'm sorry. I, I, the shelf exams? Did you no, know? we used to refer to this as something else. We had two parts to it. They had the part one that occurred after the second year of medical school and then the part two that occurred uh, just before graduation. But it wasn't called SMLE. It was called something else. Yeah, so this is United States Medical Licensing Exam, right. USMLE. Okay. Right, right. Now, Jacqueline, uh, I, I assume we have microbiology and virology on the USMLE exam? Yeah, sure. Well, we have this week in microbiology okay. and this week in virology. Because you say there aren't fantastic podcasts. <laughs> exactly. Like this one. And those are fantastic podcasts. <laughs> I dare say. Dixon, oh, I'm next. You're next. Wink writes, dear TWIP professors, you've got me again. There are a lot of causes of a red eye and many etiologies for retinal granulomas. But I do not know when one follows the other. I discounted Chagas disease and onchocerciasis because I think they are rare in Panama toxoplasmosis, and cysticercosis because they are acquired by ingestion and would not affect the anterior eye. I also considered a veterinary anterior eye pathogen, Thalasia calipida, or calipida? Calipida. Calipida, because it has been known to rarely infect humans, but not the retina, I believe. I am going to go with a larva migraines syndrome possibly caused by toxocaracanus. Here's hoping. Wink Weinberg in Atlanta. Right. Oh, Dixon, you got the I got big, the big one. one. I got the big one. Kevin <laughs> writes, TWIP 169, Kevin Kearney. A worm's eye view is how he titles this. Case of a nine-year-old rural Panamanian boy with a history of a red irritated eye of one or two weeks, which resolved. He presented to clinic with a few months later with a complaint of significant monocular 
vision loss, fundoscopic examination showed a retinal retraction and a quiet granuloma in the macula. I strive for detached objectivity in my relationship with parasites. However, the male factor in this uh, case is uh, displaying exceptional perversity in its choice of resistance. Residence. Residence. <laughs> sorry, residence. The human liver has an estimated volume of 1,500 cubic centimeters. Compare this with the volume of a typical adult eye, which is six cubic centimeters. So much available territory in the human body. Why settle in the eye? And even worse, why set up shop in the macula, a mere 5.5 millimeter patch of tissue, which includes the 1.5 millimeter fovea, where all of the critical visual work, such as reading, is done. The eye displays an amazing combination of vulnerability and durability. It can be punched, scratched, infected, but usually keeps on working. But please do not mess with the macula. Such are the vicissitudes of human biology. A complete recounting of ocular parasitosis would fatigue the most ardent parasitological dilettante. Suffice to say that we could name at least 35 bad actors in the parasite union that screw up the human eye, ranging from protozoa to maggots, even the disgusting crab louse merits a mention. The list quickly dwindles, however, when we consider a unilateral posterior pole granuloma in a child. Our patient is likely to be immunosuppressed, therefore toxoplasmosis is unlikely, and also it is not typically associated with granuloma formation. However, the case report by Massa in the end notes describes a posterior pole granuloma due to toxoplasma. Note, a granuloma can be briefly defined as a nodular aggregation of histiocytes, macrophages, and prens, and often containing multiple other of immune cells and collagen. This inflammatory mass is an attempt to wall off a foreign body or infectious organism. A classic example of granuloma formation is seen in tuberculosis. Other common ocular parasites, such as onchocerciasis, um, onchocerca rather, and cystocercosis or loa loa, do not usually cause posterior pole granulomas and would cause the clinical presentation or and 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 would cause or would not cause the clinical presentation of our patient. The most likely diagnosis here is ocular larva migraines due to Toxicara species, probably Toxicara canis. It frequently affects children and is typically unilateral. Disease in children is via oral ingestion of soil contaminated with infectious feces of dogs or cats. Prevalence of the disease varies widely and is common in non-industrialized world. The disease is seen in the United States, but at a But a 20-year case series uh, from UCSF only reported 22 cases of ocular toxicariasis. Reviews commonly state that the disease is unilateral in 90% of the cases, but some reports say 40%. Diagnosis is often clinical by demonstration of typical fundus findings. Eosinophilia is not typically seen in ocular larval migraines in contrast to visceral larval migraines. Enzyme immunoassay is used, but a negative test does not rule out the infection. Treatment usually involves a combination of systemic and topical corticosteroids corticosteroids combined with albendazole. Unfortunately, in our case, the granuloma probably represents an immune reaction to an already dead parasite with likely permanent destruction of the macula. Theoretically, if the patient were treated at the time of his initial symptoms, perhaps the pathological process could have been interrupted. I could find nothing in the literature that described very early detection and treatment of ocular larval migraines. Surgical management is used to manage late complications such as retinal detachment and vitreous opacification. I suspect that this child will have permanent visual loss in the affected eye. Prevention of this problem would involve limiting exposure to contaminated soil and treatment of infected dogs and cats. Thanking the twip snappers, no twipper twipper snappers for their selfless educational mission. It is selfless. It is, and there's a whole bunch of terminal and endnote curiosities which I'm not going to read. No, but I will say that there are extensive extensive comments on uh, ocular diseases of all sorts, including a table with different locations of different things, laundry list of ocular pests. I presume you're putting this in the show notes. Of course, and, but I do want to read. Read a terminal curiosity, Dixon. <laughs> um, you have to find it. I have it right in front. you want me to read it? No, I got it. A terminal curiosity. A terminal curiosity. As a child, I was always mystified by the image of someone putting a raw steak or a black eye. On a black eye. A raw steak on a black eye. Sugulation 
ecchymoses, hematoma. Of course, I never saw a real person doing this. It was a trope from television and sitcoms and cartoons. It made absolutely no sense to me. Years later, in a color atlas of parasitology, I saw a picture of someone using a frog, and it made absolutely no uh, in a similar manner, this brings me to the bizarre tale of ocular spargonosis, a condition rarely due to the application of frog or snake raw meat poultices, or perhaps the practice is not so bizarre. See Dr. Depamier's book, People, Parasites, and Plowshares, where he discusses the theoretical benefits of the frog poultice due to antimicrobial frog skin compounds named meganins by M. Zasloff, as well as describing the deprecation <laughs> the depredations of spirometromancinoides. I will leave the reader to explore this topic independently and exit with advice to generally avoid the application of raw meats to the face. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah, very good. Yep. Uh, Daniel, you're next. Yeah, I was going to say, I actually did that once as a child. I don't know. I had a rough childhood. <laughs> and uh, you know, some of my education came from maybe sources outside my parents. And uh, we recommend against putting raw meat on your eye. Because <laughs> uh, as good. people can probably imagine, the outside of a steak often has bacteria such as E. coli. And it, it's not really great to take... Uh, a bacterial covered piece of raw meat and place it over your eye. You know, we're not going to get sparginosis in the in the United States, but uh, you could actually end up infecting your eye. You know, you could get sparginosis in the United States. I'm sorry to disagree, but there from is a, there have from, been some cases not from a steak, I guess. No, not no, never from a steak. That's true. <laughs> but I want to add something else that steaks were used for in the old days during the early uh, formation of baseball as a formal sport. Uh -huh. They used to use pieces of meat for their gloves. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Okay. Used to buy like shirt, skirt steaks and stuff like this. What do you this. mean they'd use them for their gloves? They use, they use, instead of a glove, they didn't have gloves. That's and the ball was very hard. Are you, are you going with this, that the people were out there with a piece of steak in their hand catching baseballs? Do you, they, you believe well, they weren't, they weren't I exactly. I don't buy it, Dan. I don't buy it. <laughs> oh, come on, kids. <laughs> Give me, give me Dixon his, has been fabricating, some slack. Can't some fabricating slack. a lot of stuff. No, today. well, no. Based on experiences, I can defend all of these uh, half truths. <laughs> you out there with a with a strip steak in your hand catching baseballs right. and put it on the yeah, barbecue. Forget about uh, catching baseballs with it. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, Ben. Ben writes, uh, "Dear biological and technical twiplicates, <laughs> wow. my guess for this week is ocular larva migrants caused by either toxic canis or cati. According to Parasitic Diseases Sixth Edition, the child is around the right age." And the symptoms seem to fit well. I'm not sure whether or not seeing the child when they first developed the eye inflammation and treating would have had much benefit. From PD6, it seems as if there isn't enough information on drug treatment of OLM to know. I did have two other questions regarding OLM that hopefully the TWIP team can answer. Toxicara? Canis and cati are regularly spoken about together when it comes to OLM. Do we know what proportion of OLM are caused by each species, and does the pathology differ? Also, considering OLM can present like retinoblastoma, would it be feasible in a resource-limited setting to exclude retinoblastoma in the child, particularly if you didn't have an ophthalmologist around? Just because it fits the theme of the case, I hope I've attached an SEM image I took of toxic hair canis at a fantastic parasitology course run by the Australian Society for Parasitology. Mm. I've temporarily vacated sunny Adelaide and moved significantly northward as part of a collaborative research grant. And so the weather here in Hamburg, Germany, is currently it's very 13 north. feet and raining. <laughs> wow. Yards, ben. And this is from Ben Lifner. He's a Ph. candidate in uh, the Wilson Lab. It's a malaria biology lab at the Research Center for Infectious Diseases yeah. at the University of Adelaide. Right. Well, I, I can all right, we'll go back to the question, but uh, briefly stated, cats – are more fastidious than dogs. So cats tend to bury their feces, and so therefore the uh, contamination rate is lower. And so dogs can tend to randomly uh, pepper the countryside with their leavings. And um, I'm not sure if cats are less or more popular as pets around the world than dogs. 
So it would matter as to how many of each were around as to which one was the most responsible for causing it in that particular area. So you'd have to do some local epidemiology with that as, as well. I'm in the process of pasting his photo into the show notes. Dixon, Great. If you refresh the screen, do you know how to do that? It's got a little circle on it, and yeah, then you yeah, go yeah. back and refresh it, but I have to go to the top to do that. Well, what's the problem there? What's the problem? No, no, Daniel, no, can you see the no, thing I, I pasted I just did in? It. I just did it. Is this, this uh, yes, I can see this. That's really, that's really frightening. Yeah. Frightening. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you when you bring it up, you're going to say, wow. Oh, that is frightening. So, you know, you know, when you magnify, <laughs> when you magnify stuff, it looks quite uh, impressive. the anterior end of this parasite or the posterior end of this parasite? I'd say an anterior, right? With these would be the... Mouth part? Uh, well... No? What are you thinking? I'm not thinking yet. I want to know which end is which first. I don't know. I'd have to look at this one more carefully. It doesn't look like the opening to a typical nematode mouth part, but I could be wrong. I'm not fabricating in this case. I'm just speculating. Nathan writes, I'm very excited that we'll be discussing eye parasites for the next few case studies. They are my favorite dinner table stories to tell. There are four organisms that come to mind immediately when eye parasites are mentioned. Acanth amoeba species, Oncocerca volvulus, Toxocaracanus, and of course, Loa Loa. Mm -hmm. This was the case of a nine-year-old boy visited a mobile clinic in Bocas del Toro in the Caribbean. He developed redness in the eye followed by significant vision complications. The boy has some recognition of movement but is unable to see anything clearly. Retinal retraction and granuloma were noted over the macula of the infected eye. Well, question one, what do you think this is? This sounds like a classic case of T. canis. The two biggest complications of this parasite in humans is visceral larvae of migraines and ocular larvae of migraines. People can be infected when they ingest embryonated eggs. This is common in low-income communities with lots of stray dogs. According to six edition of PD, page 314, T. canis commonly causes ocular larvae of migraines in kids ages at 5 to 10 years old. Most serious complication is invasion of the retina and a granuloma that can drag the retina, which can lead to a detachment of the macula. This can present as a unilateral vision impairment. The boy was likely infected through contact with dog feces. This parasite is common in dogs, particularly in the developing world. Sometimes kids can ingest the feces when playing in the dirt, the dreaded sandbox, or directly interacting with a stray dog. This organism is unable to complete its life cycle in humans, so the damage is caused by the migrating larva. The treatment is albendazole two times per day for five days. I would also recommend that the boy stop playing with stray animals. Well, he's not going to be able to see them anymore. Right. Question two, what might we have done when the boy was first seen at the mobile clinic? If the redness of the eye was investigated further during the first visit, I suppose a CBC with differential would lead the docs to suspect some type of parasitic infection due to an elevated eosinophil percent. There are immunological tests available for T. canis, so perhaps one could be ordered based upon the eye redness and eosinophilia. I am looking forward to the Whoa. next few cases, which is I is spelled E Y E. Nathan, <laughs> exactly. All right, Nathan, I have a um, an addition to your um, description here that it, it says that sometimes kids can ingest the feces when playing in the dirt. This is not going to give you the infection because the eggs have to incubate in the soil for about a week, just like the other Ascaris uh, species that we have, like Ascaris sum in pigs or Ascaris lumbricoides in humans. So uh, the feces has to be there for a while, and uh, in most situations, it's redistributed by earthworms, and the eggs also are redistributed by earthworms that come in and uh, feed on the fecal um, pellet and then redistribute what's inside in their own gut tracts as they move through the soil. So you can actually have Toxicara eggs in places where the feces wasn't, which is an interesting uh, thing. Also, birds... Uh, with their feet, can pick up the eggs and move them from place to place without having the feces involved in that as well. So some different different approaches to explaining what's happening here. So Carrie writes, Dear hosts, 
an eye condition with pain and vision loss in a parasite context, parasitic context, immediately brings Onchocerca volvulus to mind. But on second glance, this doesn't really, that was a pun, I hope, but on second glance, this doesn't really fit any of the case details. We have no report of itching or skin nodules. The findings from the eye exam aren't consistent with river blindness, and although O. volvulus is found in the Americas, there aren't many areas where it is still common. A better fit would be the one of the intestinal nematodes that normally infects animals, but in humans, human beings unable to complete their life cycle crawl off into other parts of the body and wreck various kinds of havoc, cutaneous, visceral, or in this case, ocular larval migrants. There are a pair of handy hookup tables in PD6 edition. A few of the organisms that infect skin affect conjunctiva, but we are seeing something in the eye itself here. However, on the VLM table, Toxicara species stand out as uniquely affecting the eye as well as the viscera. Usually, Toxicariasis results in either VLM or OLM, or not both, and children, often five or more, are likely to have ocular infection. In ocular Toxicariasis, the larva, sometimes only one, invades the red and may cause the formation of a granuloma, which can distort or detach the red and naturally causes a visual impairment, potentially blindness. In Infection is typically unilateral, and redness and inflammation of the eye are also symptoms. In short, it fits our clinical picture exactly. A granuloma typically forms when the larva dies, so since they cannot reproduce in humans, the infection has probably already run its course. Anti-helminthic drugs probably won't be of any use, and in the event that there are more larvae present, killing them all at once could make matters worse rather than better. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the damage to his eye is permanent and he probably won't recover vision. There are surgical techniques which can repair or ameliorate the damage. However, I harbor doubts as to what surgical options would be available to this patient given the circumstances. Had the patient been able to access treatment when symptoms first appeared, he should have been treated with corticosteroids, which may have helped reduce the damage to his sight. Surgery, if available, may still have been been required. As far as exposure goes, Toxicara is found worldwide. Eggs of the feces of an infected dog, cat, or fox embryonate in soil, aha, and then are ingested. Infection is most likely in children who eat sand or dirt, or uh, which would tend to be younger children. It can also occur through a, for example, an inadequate hand washing, which seems like likely in the circumstances. It's unlikely that dogs and cats that in this impoverished remote community are regularly dewormed. Diagnosis would normally be based on the clinical presentation since the immunological tests aren't particularly reliable for ocular toxicoriasis. It is thought that with a lower parasitic load, the larvae are likely to quietly migrate to the eye while a higher load <clears throat> produces a large immune response resulting in both visceral disease and positive tests. This is also why younger children who are more, who are more likely to infect themselves with many larvae by playing with and sometimes eating dirt or sand, are more likely to present with VLM. <clears throat> An ELISA test, uh, if it didn't come back with a false negative, could distinguish between T. canis and T. cati, but the distinction is probably not important for the patient. One other condition that should be particularly carefully ruled out is retinoblastoma, granuloma from tox ocular toxicoriasis are always mistaken for this type of cancer, and while that's an undesirable mistake to make, potentially resulting in the unnecessary removal of an eye, the reverse could be worse. Best regards, Carrie of Newcastle upon Tyne, England, solo on this occasion. Caitlin sends her regards, but could not assist as she was bitten by a radioactive spider in the course of her day job and is currently busy with her new secret identity. Ah, spider woman. If I win the book... Please leave it at a majority railway station with major, a major, 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 <laughs> major railway station with a label tied to it saying, "Please look after this book." <laughs> is that a is that a Paddington reference? I'm trying to decide. I'm not sure. I don't know. But this is a clever, a tag team of <laughs> women who pay attention uh, and uh, give us some sharp answers. I really appreciate their input. It uh, livens up our. Not otherwise straightforward podcast, but I, I like the uh, the banter that uh, comes about as a result. I like their output. You do, eh? Yeah, eh? <laughs> All right. Well, there we have it. Quite there a few we do guesses. Have it. We and, do uh, have it. It's been a I few guess weeks. Two, two more to go. Two more to go. What, what are you guys thinking? Well, <clears throat> Vincent, why don't you go first? Well, 
Dixon asked me this this morning, <laughs> and I said, well, I said, Loa Loa, but it wouldn't go in the retina. Nope. And he said, before I could say anything further, it's got to be <laughs> Toxocara. I said, well, thank you for letting me figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> we have lovely conversations here in the- We do. Sometimes studio. it's a little staccato, but- uh, Staccato? That's right. What does that mean? It's like that. Staccato. What did you think, Dixon? No, I, I totally agree with well, most why, of the why diagnoses. Would you, why would you think this? Uh, because I wrote the book, first of all. <laughs> I also wrote a review chapter on toxic, toxic psoriasis, so I'm pretty familiar with the literature and the presentation, and this is classic. So it's highly unlikely that there are no dogs and cats in the in the local vicinity of where this little kid is from, because that's just part of the scene that everybody encounters when they go to these kinds of uh, villages that... Uh, have the entire ecosystem of a humanity uh, running back and forth through their houses. And as a result, I'm not making a value judgment on that. I'm just saying that they value pets very much and keep them around and, and for good reasons, because I think cats and dogs uh, ingest a lot of things that would otherwise give us problems, like reduvid bugs, for instance, and things like that. So, um, and I kept this pest management um, uh, things, which, you know, rats and that sort of thing. So it's it's a good thing to have pets around. I think ocular ocular larva migraines, by the way, is a result of long term exposure to visceral larva migraines larvae, which have been reacted to, and immune pressure. Once the worms reach the eye, which is an immunologically silent organ, remain there. As the result, it's like a safe haven. Once they get there and they stay there. So uh, this could very well have started out as VLM, uh, but ends up as the result of the immune response that the patient engenders against the larvae that are present, not in the eye, but in other places, to result in the sequestering of these larvae in this area. So I think it's ocular larva migraines due to a toxic or canis or cat eye. So Dan Daniel, what did you do next? Yeah, it's actually as you were saying all that. Did, didn't you and I co-wrote a chapter for one of the pediatric yes, yes, we did. infectious we did. disease yes, textbooks yes. on this specific topic? Yes, so, we did. Yeah, so hopefully uh, we know we know what we're talking about. <laughs> so, <laughs> hopefully, right. And actually, uh, I think a couple <laughs> things I'll say is uh, one of our um, – listeners uh, sent in a really nice table. I'm going to just sort of page up to it, which I think really um, is a nice way of uh, sort of putting this together. And as I've right. warned or suggested to the people, we're going to have another eye case after this. So uh, perhaps people interested in our next case and figuring it out might want to make use. But certain parasites go to certain parts of the eye. I mean, the eye is not just a a homogenous um, chunk of something. It has various <laughs> aspects to it. And um, there's the area around it where we'll see, as they sort of describe the orbital cellulitis and the conjunctiva and then the anterior chamber, the iris, vitreous, subretinal space, and then the retina itself. And depending on where you see the pathology and what sort of pathology you see, um, the ophthalmologist can often make this diagnosis without any fancy tests. Um, so in this case, I think our, our listeners, um, uh, you know, we gave them everything they needed to know, including um, an expert ophthalmology eye exam. And uh, that was our impression that uh, yeah. this was ocular larva migrants. Right. Um, and um, the, the discussion that the ophthalmologist and I had um, was the, you know, what could have happened differently if it was two to three months before. Um, and this is actually um, an ophthalmologist who does a lot of this um, remote care, tropical medicine. Um, and uh, he's often treated people with steroids up front. And you can end up with um, a little less of the um, the retinal retraction, um, which which he really felt based on where the granuloma was, the retinal retraction, which was ultimately having the had the biggest and now permanent impact on the visual clarity. Um, when we do do steroids in this setting, we actually have a, a protocol where we throw, what do we throw at him whenever you give someone in a uh, strongaloides endemic area a high dose of steroids? Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we always treat it. We don't, you don't test for whether Whoops. or not struggling. We just go ahead and hit them with um, uh, ivermectin at the same uh, time. That's right. That's um, right. So that was would have been. So that would have been his approach had he been there two to three months earlier. The only tough thing is what percentage of red eyes 
are ocular larval migraines. And fortunately, it's quite low, but I'll say I could say, unfortunately, it's quite low. So often I think unless you have an ophthalmologist who can really get a good fundoscopic exam, you, you probably miss, probably a lot of this gets missed. Later on, you're seeing people at this stage where I don't have clear vision, you now have access to someone who can get a good fundoscopic exam, and then they can recognize a granuloma formation there. So, yeah. Did you do anything further with the boy? No, I mean, unfortunately, at this point, this is now permanent. There's the scarring, the granuloma, the retinal retraction, and this boy always will, in that one eye, um, not have clear vision. Fortunately, his other eye, he had sharp, clear vision, so he's still going to see the stray dogs that you guys Oh, okay. <laughs> he's like, let's still play with the stray, stray. And I think it is interesting, the age issue, is that, you know, a lot of these people are probably over and over exposed to uh, the different dog and cat ascarids. In this area, mostly dog. Um, and it is, um, in the U S they did a survey. It was in a paper a few years back where they asked all the ophthalmologists, um, and basically everyone to the, to the T is that the expression had seen at least one case. Um, so it's, it's not, yeah. you know, it's not unheard of in, even here in the United States. I think Peter Hotez talks about how there's probably a lot more, um, visceral and ocular larval migraines than people really appreciate. And if you, if you think about it, if the ocular larval migraines is not in the wrong place and you don't get this retinal, um, retraction, you often can go as something that's sort of discovered incidentally, but, um, the visceral larval migraines, a lot of people think has an issue on cognition and school performance That's and right. other things like that. Maybe, right. um, you know, a lot more. And I, I think it was a few years ago, there was a competition where someone in the competition, one of the infectious disease fellows, did a survey of the New York City parks where the dogs yep. frequent. That's right. And, uh, you know, I hate to say, but apparently not everyone deworms their dogs on a regular basis. No. Um, at least by evidence by the amount of uh, dog and cat ascarids. <laughs> in the parks of New York city. Right. And don't forget, they've got these things now called dog runs where the, all the dogs are crowded into this little zone. I mean, that sounds like a waiting room in a hospital where there's an epidemic of influenza and people go to get diagnosed and they give it to the people that are sitting there waiting to get diagnosed for something else. And so these parks, these dog runs are, are real issues that you might <laughs> want to look into because I think they're becoming much more popular throughout the world to sort of try to sequester where dog feces is found. And yeah. uh, what you're doing is just all the dog owners, and of course, then they walk outside to walk their dogs home. So they could be carrying all these things with them out. So Has anyone looked at dog runs? Well, or that's or a good question because I, I, I sure would, if I was a city epidemiologist for the health department, if, yeah, if, if, if the rate of ocular uh, larval migraines was high, I would certainly be uh, suspicious that the dog runs were major sources of, of contamination. Mm. Yeah, no, so I'm going to say so they have, but the interesting, I come at it from the other side is, I think, as I may have mentioned to our listeners before, we're doing uh, the puppy rearing part uh, of a oh, yes. dog for canine companions. Um, so Hattie will grow up to help someone with disabilities. And part of the rules is that she can't go to one of those parks because they would right. be concerned about the experience. The exposures that they get when you, you get them, you know, it's like, you know, it was, if you send your kids to daycare, it's a great <laughs> they're going home, them. With, they're gonna come home with who knows what. <laughs> and right. it's the same with sending your dog to uh, play in one of these areas. Um, they almost need like cards or something, you know, where you like show that once a month you, uh, you know, directly observed uh, deworming oh, and other interesting, things. But, interesting. Interesting. Uh, but it's, no, so so yeah, so and I and I think Dixon brought this up several times as our emailers went in. Um, the life cycle is is important in that there's this um, we'll say roughly seven day um, period of time from defecation of non-infective eggs to the time that they have embryonated and become infective. So exactly. the dog feces, you know, dogs always licking themselves. That's not going to get you. It's got to get in the soil. It That's needs right. this period of time to um, advance to an infective um, egg. And then the infective eggs um, get in your mouth and then you end up with these disorders, which, you know, you could get from a dog, right? Dogs walking around in the areas where they do their sure. stuff, you know, so the dog could still be involved in that passage, but it's not going to be a fresh feces exposure. Right. Hmm. Fascinating. Yep. Oh, and hyper urbanization throughout the world right now as a result of climate change issues is uh, obviously driving more people into the cities and creating 
even more problems. And to say that this is a rural disease, it used to be a rural disease. And in fact, it was it was mostly associated with kennels uh, in rural the, the rural South, which is they get a year round. Uh, climate that allows them to keep the dogs outside all the time and to raise them uh, to sell, of course, hybrid, you know, these uh, uh, fancy dogs, um, breeds and stuff like this. There are over 400 now, as I recall. Um, and they can all harbor this parasite, by the way. And it's trans uh, placental, So the mother can actually give this infection to her pups before they're born. So you can say, oh, well, at least this puppy just came out. You know, it was a brand new puppy, so it can't possibly have been contaminated. And that's not how this works. It's actually uh, can get into the pup this way and, and then mature as uh, uh, adult worms. So the, the, I learned this by <laughs> knowing that they were, were trying to raise germ-free beagles for some radiation biology experiments. And uh, the, the, the germ-free beagles that were started were, were – uh, derived cesareanly from a pregnant female beagle, of course, and brought into the isolator and raised uh, totally uh, without microbes. Mm. At least that's what they thought. And what did they end up with? They ended up with Asker's infection, Toxicara canis. Yeah. Then, Where the hell did those come from? You know, and then they found out, of course, it was transplacental. Transplacental, that'll do it. Yep. All right, should we give away a book? You bet. I was going to throw a last thing before the book because mm-hmm. this is something that came up. I started to think, you know, so I asked the ophthalmologist about this this thing we've been putting in our book for a while about the confusion. Oh, someone might confuse this for a retinoblastoma and take out the boy's eye. Um, he seemed a little um, sort of unsure that that was something that happened. And his argument, and, and I'm, I, maybe our emailers, our listeners can look at this a little further. Uh, his comment was, no one who has enough skill to actually remove an eye is going to be lacking in the education to be able to distinguish. And he said, this does not look like a retinoblastoma. Retinoblastoma is pretty characteristic. So I know we've been saying that forever, and I actually was taught by Dixon that. So so I'm curious. Well, are there really documented cases? Let me of, back off. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then we can have a discussion has, now. This has this ever really happened? Has there, anyone ever really taken right. out? Not for Toxicara. No, I don't I don't know any examples of that either. And, and like you said, we just wrote a review article together, and I don't know of any examples we cited but cystocercosis of the eye does look like retinoblastoma and i can promise you it does because the army institute of pathology has lots of eyes that were removed uh for the reason of thinking it was retinoblastoma only to turn out that it was due to cystocercosis hmm. so now they have a good test for cystocercosis so you don't have to do it that way anymore but that's the one that does look very much like retinoblastoma this one no, nah, it doesn't look like retinoblastoma, I don't think. But, you know, an inexperienced ophthalmologist, although it's hard to find one of those people because they undergo such rigorous training <laughs> that there's no such thing as an inexperienced ophthalmologist because of the long residencies that they spend. Um, maybe in yeah. areas where you don't have this presented a lot? You know, I, I don't think so. I don't think so. Yeah, I do wonder. I mean, I I, I, agree found, I found I Daniel. definitely found a lot of references where they say there's been this sort of, but you know, I found like a paper in 1961 saying in the past. So right. I'm very curious if it's right. ever really happened or if it's been one of those. I remember when I was training and and I got like two facts. They were talking about how with colon cancer, the majority of the cancers were now right sided, uh, but then in the next sentence they said that you know the majority of colon cancers are within the reach of your finger. And I, I tried to do the math and I'm like figuring who has a six foot long finger right but uh, so. an II. do you know what an II is by the way it's a, <laughs> if you look it up you'll see what i mean by that it's a very small mammal with a very long finger <laughs> all right book time yep we have as far as i can tell three individuals who are eligible three out of all those okay hmm. so i'm going to pick a number that narrows it down doesn't between it? one and three and the number is two. Bingo. Our second is Ben. Outstanding. Yeah, ben is in Hamburg. Great. So, Ben, if you would provide your address. And also a telephone for international shipping. Twip at microbe.tv. You'll get a hardcover copy of PD6 signed by Dixon and Daniel. 
And those are running out of stock. It's collector's items, Again? aren't they? <laughs> yeah, no, we so all the PD sixes to date have all been printed and, and however many you've got there, uh Vincent, those are the last ones before we have to uh oh, print cool. P D seven. I right, have though. six. I have six signed ones left. Okay, so we're gonna have to get on this soon. Yeah. We have a paper for your digestion. <laughs> <laughs> published in PLOS Neglected Tropical Diseases. It's entitled Human Collectin 11 and its synergic genetic interaction with MASP2 are associated with the pathophysiology of Chagas disease. Look at that. From Taisa Lucas Sandri uh, and Andrade Lidani Einig Bolt Mord Müller Essen and Iara Messias Reason from the University of Tübingen and the Federal University of Paraná in Brazil. It's all about Chagas disease, which is an anthroposunosis. Right. Meaning what? Well, there's a nexus between <laughs> the wildlife and the people. Because <laughs> a zoonosis yeah. is a... Infection going from animals to people. That's right. So what is the anthroposunosis? Well, I think there's a lot of transfer from people to wildlife, too. There can be. Back least. and forth, you're yeah, saying? Yeah, back and forth. Back and forth. So T. cruzi. Yes. How do we get T. cruzi from a kissing bug? Yes. And no, no, say it, Vincent. I know you like to say reduvido. it. Reduvido. There you go. <laughs> but then do we give it back? <laughs> to the reduvido? To whatever, for they're making an anthroposunosis. We certainly, know. we could. How? How do we do this? All it has to do is take a blood meal. Does so that happen? I want to know. That's so, how it happens. And so how do we know? Because that's how we do xenodiagnosis, for instance. No, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We don't do that too much. You want to explain xenodiagnosis? Sure. You take the redu VD bugs that don't have an infection. They were raised in the laboratory. And with a patient that you suspect of having T. cruzi, you let them feed on them. On the blood. Not, you, not the person. You, no, no, on no, the person. No, no, on, on the, the person. person. On, on the, the person. person. It's, it's a silent bite. They don't even feel the fact that they've been bitten because they inject an anesthetic at the same time. That's why they're called kissing bugs. And, right, not, and then they're also called assassin bugs. Do they bugs, examine agree, the bug after a certain period? They do. They do. About two weeks later. It's a long, uh, drawn-out procedure. What a lab test, man. I know. I can I, do better. Well, they do do better now. With gnats, they have gnats so that they don't have to worry now, about it anymore. Do, in nature, is there evidence for this going back into the reduvids and something else. Besides the reduvids in humans, what else? Nothing. You know, all the other mammals of South America, basically. Well, you just said nothing. No, no, what I thought it? you meant other bugs besides no, no. reduvids. But animals, a lot of mammals. Right? All of them. What is the evidence that it goes from human back to those? Because they're calling it an anthropos. I know. So that. I want to know the evidence. I Well, I'm, I'm not going to guess at this any more than Daniel is because I'm not that familiar with the literature, but I suspect that the evidence comes from people and their pets. No, I guess I'll, I'll jump in. Um, yeah, and the, actually the xenodiagnosis is sort of part of this, is that they've observed that um, individuals who are infected with um, Chagas, there's a chronicity. And by that chronicity, not just, you know, weeks, months, but a patient or, yeah, I'm going to use the word patient. So an individual who's infected with Chagas disease, they can continue to transmit uh, the parasites back to the reduvid bugs, basically introduce it back into the system for years. And so this xenodiagnosis that mm -hmm. uh, we were discussing, um, here you are, you get bit, you've infected, you've been, you know, you had your acute chagas or not. So you're now in this um, intermediate stage where we don't know what's going to end up happening with you. You still can potentially get that back into reduvid bugs and the reduvid yeah. bugs can then be eaten, let's say by a dog exactly. or oh, they can actually yes. go ahead and feed on a small rodent or whatever. Um, so yeah, so we're, we're part of this. But um, what a lot of people try to point out is that at least in today's world, most of this disease is occurring in the in the non-human mammal populations. Sure. And we're, we're sort of a small part of this. Yeah, some small part though. There's about 12 million people infected with Chagas throughout the world. I like the anthropo there, and it reminds yeah, me of yeah. the – we are now in the Anthropocene. Scene. That's right. <laughs> when basically defined by humans messing up the world. Correct. And right. a big study from the UN just came out about biodiversity, which has something to do with our topic today as well. We're killing it. We are. About a million species we're endangering right now. So. Lovely.
Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, Daniel, what got you excited about this paper? You know, as a as a clinician, one of the big concerns I have uh, with uh, Chagas disease is, as um, you know, not to belittle the amount of Chagas, but there's uh, over, let's say, over 10 million people who are infected. Um, it's not a disease that uh, is without concern in the U.S. We estimate over 300,000 people infect the United States, um, and there's. There's three aspects to it. There's the acute Chagas. Then there's what we call this indeterminate stage. We're not really sure where it's headed. And then the the late manifestations, um, which are cardiac or gastrointestinal. And the big challenge for us is we don't know at this point who is going to go on to develop cardiac or digestive issues um, versus who is going to continue through life without any symptoms at all. And about a third of all people that are infected, I would say at least a third, will go on to develop some manifestation. And so as clinicians, we're trying to figure out who do we need to focus on, who needs treatment. The other, I'll say a little frustrating thing as a clinician is we're not even sure that treating people during this intermediate um, stage has um, as positive an impact as we once hoped, uh, based on, on a study a few years ago where we took patients that we felt were the highest risk for cardiac manifestations, we treated them, and we were not able to show that there was an impact on the ultimate outcome um, of cardiac manifestations. So we're, we're still in search of answers to who do we need to worry about, and then maybe more importantly, understanding the pathophysiology. So maybe we can come up with a treatment that will make a difference um, mm-hmm. in these patients. And this, I was excited. I'm always excited. Anything that um, I feel like has a direct um, or potential to lead to a direct clinical impact for patients who've been infected Mm -hmm. with Chagas. All right. So here they look at complement. Right. A component, a specific component of the complement collection of serum proteins, which are involved in Eliminating Amazingly pathogens. Amazingly complex, it's, it's, isn't it? <laughs> it complements, complements antibody. Yeah. And th- there is some evidence that complement might be involved, and particularly a component called collectin-11. Right. That could be a rock group, collectin-11. <laughs> and this um, has is the gene encoding collectin, which uh, recognizes carbohydrates, Mm. on pathogens. And we know that T. cruzi has carbohydrates on its surface of a variety of sorts. Absolutely. So collectin-11 can recognize a carbohydrate, and then it activates this, the complement cascade, which will eventually eliminate the pathogens. Right. Uh, so there are known genetic variants of collectin-11, and a particular one has been associated with a higher prevalence of urinary schistosomiasis. All right, so precedent for this particular collectin to be associated with different presentations, as Daniel said. And so they, they did a study in people, 251 patients with chronic Chagas. These are people who were in the Chagas disease Hospital de Clinicas, Federal University of Paraná. And they said, let's get a little uh, blood from them. We made sure they're CD positive. And then they looked at their collectin 11 genotype. Mm. Very straightforward study. First thing, collectin 11 in plasma. Right. What's the story? And then what is the genotype of their collectin? 11, exactly, exactly. right? So they found that in these patients, their plasma levels of collectin 11 were significantly lower than in controls, all right? First thing. Second thing, that low plasma doesn't correlate with any of the genetic variants that they looked at. They have a bunch that, of specific polymorphisms that they're looking for. However, there's one particular variant of collectin 11. And I want you to remember this, Dixon, because it's going to be on the quiz. I'm committing as <laughs> as we speak. RS 7567833G. Got it. That variant was significantly <laughs> higher in chronic Chagas patients. Mm-hmm. And it also occurred more frequently among patients with the cardiodigestive form compared right. to. Right. Megacolon, megasophagus. Yeah. And carriers of the G allele so it could be AG or GG, were present among patients presenting this cardio 
digestive form. Hmm. And so we have a particular polymorphism associated with more serious uh, chronic disease, okay? And so they say, well, what could this do? And they did a computer analysis and said this could affect the function of the protein, but that they didn't actually do any experiments to say, what is this allele doing on the function of the protein? which is associated with uh, a more serious disease. And the other thing they did, we know that uh, there is another protein called MASP2. Right, relates to a serine protease, as I recall. Yes. Is it part of the complement cascade or it's separate? I think it's separate. But there is interaction between, genetic interactions between the two, and they find that, in fact, um, there is uh, the risk, uh, it, the association of the, there is an association of this collect an 11 allele that we just mentioned in the mass mm. to a certain carrier uh, in, in patients with cardiodigestive and cardiomyopathy compared to healthy controls. Mm-hmm. And that's, that is the, the study. Right. Not a trivial study, even though it's a short paper. No, not trivial. Because it takes a lot of um, skill to amass those number of people together in the right place, and then you've got to have the right genetics. Well. So interestingly, the the... And the, the this the the G is the ancestral allele. Hmm. It's being slowly replaced uh, by um, another base, which I don't remember what it is at the moment. <laughs> so they're saying that this polymorphism is a result of selection pressures over time in humans, maybe imposed on by the by the parasite. But um, what's going on? Isn't known. They don't know the impact of this change on the function of collectin eleven. Hmm. It just we know this is association between certain kind of disease and a and a mutation in the and polymorphism in the gene encoding collectin eleven. Right. But they say we need to do uh, we need to figure out what's going on. We need to look at more people and we need to do some functional studies to see what's going on. So Daniel, given that um, collectin eleven seems to be involved, what how does this potentially help you as a clinician? Yeah, so it's not um, it's not quite there yet, um, but I do feel like we're making a step in this direction. I thought I thought it was interesting the way they approached this because first they um, they you know first table is the levels, and then instead of looking at why are the levels different, they jumped right to well we know something about this uh, protein and we know that it has a binding region. Let's look at the genetics of the binding region. Um, so I think we're we're starting to move in a certain direction, but this is you know it's not ready for translational. Um, application quite yet. So mm-hmm. it's early, but it's it's interesting that we're starting to see um, and address the question, which maybe the answer is both, but people have always asked, you know, why do certain people go on to to get the cardiac or the digestive or even the combined cardio digestive manifestation? And, um, you know, they're, people like to be tribal, right? They break into camps. And so one camp has said, oh, it's the immune system. The other has said, oh, it's parasite persistence. And what they're maybe saying here is actually those two are linked, that your immune system impacts parasite persistence. So right. yes, everybody's correct. And now we're starting to understand why everyone is correct. And then the next step, hopefully, will be what do we do with that information to translate it into helping people? Exactly. So, Daniel, if let's say these patients with these chronic diseases have a problem with collecting 11, it cannot clear the parasite because Mm -hmm. of this polymorphism. How could that be leveraged therapeutically? Could you give them the normal gene? Actually, that that is interesting. I mean, it would come down to where's the collectin eleven being produced, right? Yeah. So, do you do you just give them, you know, an infusion, mm-hmm. and so they get mm-hmm. a higher collectin eleven, and, and it, it's actually a direct treatment, um, you know, or or you do some exciting gene therapy where you take out their cells, maybe it's being produced, and you know, like we do a sickle cell now, we use our retroviral vectors, and where, mm-hmm. um, you know, it, it'll be interesting. But I think the probably the first application, it may be that now we're going to be able to identify who's at highest risk. Yeah. And then we could start looking at therapeutics in them because it's hard when you say, okay, we got 200 people together, but you say, you know, but only a third will ever have, have mm. manifestations and it's going to take years before we see this. Oh, I see. Uh, That's a good idea. So you can yeah. identify them and treat them so they don't proceed to the chronic conditions, right? That would be ideal, you know, and I think when they put the two together, when they, they take your collectin 11, your mass two, and they have the right gene gene interactions, your odds ratio goes up to 15.2 for the cardiodigestive versus control. Mm-hmm. So that, mm-hmm. that's a very high risk, um, 
uh, genotype. And so those those are the people that you're going to probably follow more. Um, you know, you want to enroll in trials, see if we can intervene, et cetera. Hmm. So um, am I correct in thinking then that the people that have normal levels of collectin-11 are um, – and an advantage with regards to susceptibility to the infection? Do we know that they're not susceptible or less susceptible? Unfortunately, there's such a huge overlap, and uh, they, they do a figure two where they, and I actually like that they really were honest and gave you all the data versus just like the quartiles, and you can see that there's a big overlap. So there's a, lot of, yeah. there's a spread in the data. Yeah. There's no question about that. That's yeah, true. so you couldn't, and unfortunately, like that would be great, right? Is that clinician, oh, I just checked your collecting, you know, 11 right. level, and that's it's right. such and such, and here's what we can do. But mm. it really was, the they said, okay, that's interesting, but let's look now at the genetics of this functional domain so yeah the levels are not the key here i think it's the polymorphism mm -hmm. they say that maybe the the collectin is being consumed right and right. that's why the levels are lower because you have a i switch me you know you have a chronic infection which is infection, yeah. an active infection which is continuing to con consume the collectin but it's not functional yet mm -hmm. it's it's right. being lowered by right. so you know by being I, a, I would like to interject something too then that to remind our uh, our listening public, that T. cruzi infection is very unique in the sense that um, not only is it unique, but it's unique in a certain way. When the parasite gains entrance into a cell to infect, it's a trypomastica. Mm -hmm. It's a, a typical trypomastica with an undulating membrane and a flagellum <clears throat> and a large kinetoplast and a nucleus. In fact, it has the world's largest kinetoplast, as I recall. When it gets inside the cell, it turns into an amastigote stage, okay? But in getting into the cell, it doesn't get in the way a lot of other pathogens get in through a parasitophorous vacuole, and then it is included into a membrane-bound uh, space inside the cell. This parasite climbs directly into the cytoplasm. Mm -hmm. It's not surrounded by anything else except host. So getting therapeutic agents to that stage of the infection is very difficult because there's no transport mechanism for the cell to take it to that place. It's it's in naked cytoplasm, basically. So what you're talking about here with regards to interactions with complement is the trypomasticote stage that circulates in the blood as these cells lyse and release the amastigotes, which then transform back into the trypomasticote stage. And so that means that patients with with uh, high rates of disease, with uh, megacolon, megasophagus, and megacardia, they they probably have a lot of circulating trypomastigotes, as compared to the chronically ill people that have higher levels of control proteins like the collectin eleven. So that, I would like to know that. I mean, when you look in the blood of a patient that's got low levels of collectin, do they have what 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 difference is there between their uh, level of trypomastigotes in the blood and, and patients that uh, are chronically ill, but not as ill, so to speak. So the, yeah. oh, the spectrum of disease, how does that play out? Because that's that's where the action is. I mean, it's not happening inside the cells to kill them off at that level because the, the, uh, um, <clears throat> the um, cascade effect doesn't work inside cells. It works in the cytoplasm and in, in the uh, circulating uh, bloodstream. And that's a problem with this organism because it doesn't spend a lot of time there. I mean, I think I'll jump in and say, as uh, there's just another paper that came out this last uh, month where um, yeah, I'm going to use the word global warming, climate change. So that's okay on our show. And uh, as, we're me, seeing, I'm good with that. <laughs> as we're seeing things change, we're seeing um, where certain vectors um uh, live yeah. and exist, and we're seeing yeah. the reduvid um, bugs moving farther and for, farther north right. um, outside what used to be a limited range. And um, I, I think that uh, Chagas uh, is not something that you just think of, oh, it's over there, it's in the tropics, um, you know, if it takes that to get people motivated in the States. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is a disease that's expanding um, here in the United States as well. Well, we've had reduvids here. But their biting habits are different. This is very an, a very interesting um, difference between the species of reduvids that the United States has, or the northern, let's say, Mexico, and the rest of Central and South America. Because in Central and South America, the species of reduvids that bite also defecate at the same time. 
As a result, there is the opportunity of spreading the infection into the bite wound or into a mucous membrane. Mm-hmm. So I'm sorry. But the reduvid bugs in the northern hemisphere, they bite and then they don't defecate. They fly off and then they defecate somewhere else. So they probably don't take as large a blood meal or some some aspect to it like that, or they have a better sphincter, who knows? <laughs> but they they are not likely to transmit the infection in the same way as a South American or Central American Reduvid species would. The way the dogs catch it in this country, and they do catch it, they catch it by eating the bugs as they're feeding on blood from the dog. And they just say, see the bug, and they say, oh my God, I'm being bitten by some kind of a organism. I'll just bite it and then, and then that's how they catch Chagas disease. So we have it, but we don't have it in people transmitted by Reduvids. We have it in animals. So it's, yeah. it's a true zoonosis in this case. Yeah, and to remind, I mean, our listeners are probably versed in this. It's it's interesting. It's not the bite that gives you the chagas. Right. It's the, the feces that exactly. gets into the open bite wound or into the eye. And and today there was a review just about a year ago. We, we have less than 30, or I should say 30 or less, um, documented cases of locally acquired chagas um so it is interesting when we have the we have the bugs here the the vectors are increasing their range it's gonna be interesting to see where this goes true we we have more transmission through uh, transfusion um yeah actually right? yeah so most of you know we say three hundred thousand. those um those are people who are um you know in our country who got in before the country was full and so uh, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're full, aren't we? <laughs> yep, we're done. We have enough. Thank you. So. Dixon, you have a hero for us? I do. You do? You're I amazing. Do. What well, an amazing guy. It's We don't run out of heroes. That's the one th- good thing about this subject. It's got a lot of people that who's, contributed. Who's the hero today? Today, our hero is Theobald Smith. Oh, oh, he, he screwed up. <laughs> Theobald Smith screwed up? No, that was Simon Flexer. Sorry. Because <laughs> they both have halls at Rockefeller named they after do. them. This so is very thinking. true. This is very true. So I'll just read the bio. Uh, Theobald Smith, he was a physician. He was born in 1859 and died in 1934. Smith and Frederick L. Kilborn co-discovered the cause of Texas cattle fever, which was caused by a protozoan, Babesia bigemina, a protozoan parasite related to malaria. They also proved that the Lone Star Tick Amblyoma americanum, transmitted it from cow to cow. This marked the first time that an arthropod was identified as a vector for an infectious disease. This seminal finding opened the door for a flood of other similar discoveries regarding the role that arthropods play in the spread of infectious diseases. And so they became the the node from which all other vector-borne disease uh, biologies um, spread, so to speak. They took their example, applied it to their own situation, and what follows is a plethora of discoveries of mosquitoes, black flies, ticks, other species of ticks, other diseases. Uh, the unknown world of infectious disease became known. Born in Albany, New York. That's right. Went exactly. to Cornell. He did. And Albany Medical College. Exactly. And then went to Rockefeller in 1915. Yeah. And, right. and remain there till his retirement in 1929. Local boy makes good. <laughs> wow. Interesting. This is true. I'm trying to think how they received him in Texas, right? Because I don't know if New Yorkers <laughs> were that uh, welcome in Texas back. Well, no, no, back you then. know, there were, there were some people <laughs> like Frederick Remington, for instance, the artist. He lived in Brooklyn, but he used to go to Texas all the time. So I think Texas is kind of open in terms of... Uh, Welcoming New York. Welcoming for a short period of time. They don't want you to live there, but they would love for you to come and study their diseases and help them out. <laughs> yeah, there was there was a, I think it was at NPR. I think I was listening to where there was someone who wanted to study something in Texas and had trouble interviewing people, so they actually moved there. And then once they moved there, they're like, "Oh, we'll talk to you now." That's right. So it's interesting. Oh, it's like true. now you're one of us. You can- I hate to say it, but the same is true for Vermont. <laughs> Daniel, you have another case for us? Another eye case, maybe? I ah. have another eye case. So I hope people have gotten themselves ready. Um, I don't know if this one will be easier or harder for people, but we will see. Uh, uh, this is, we will see. 
Yes. Ooh. <laughs> okay. We'll be your pupils. Uh, should, should I start? <laughs> yeah. uh, this is a three-year-old girl, and uh, the same context. She's coming to one of the mobile clinics set up by the floating doctors. This is down in the Bocas del Toro Archipelago. So we are northeastern Panama, just south of Costa Rica. We're on the Atlantic side. Um, and this is a small village on a remote island. And the story is that this this three-year-old girl initially had red eye, um, was rubbing it a lot, and then later, um, the this is I'm always intrigued by this, but the the mother noticed that she seemed to have vision loss in this right eye, um, and when the girl was examined, um, the visual loss was um, was really difficult to assess. But the ophthalmologist, the same ophthalmologist, was along. He actually was in the archipelago for quite a while. And he did a fundoscopic exam. He was there when I was there, by the way. That's uh, my exposure to this stuff. But uh, he sees on fundoscopic exam what he describes as a band keratopathy. And this is calcium on the cornea. Um, and he sees outer retinal punctate lesions. Okay, so we've got this girl, initial red eye, visual loss, and now um, band keratopathy um, and retinal punctate lesions. And so I'm going to throw the same thing at people. What do we think is going on and uh, what should we be doing about it? Mm. Band keratopathy? Yes, yes. It's a new one for me. That is calcium on the cornea. Is that band keratopathy? And keratopathy. And, you know, people, again, this is, you know, it's an open book, right? People can do a little bit of Googling. They can start thinking about, um, they can look at our chart and see where, where the involvement is, um, thanks to our email mm. who sent that. People can access that chart. They also, we have a chart in our book. Um, and uh, they can look up band keratopathy and, and try to put this together. What do we think is going on? So what, what Daniel's referring to is the letter from Kevin. He has a chart. Of various eye afflictions, and um, that will be in the show notes. Where are the show notes? You may say, "Aha!" Uh-huh. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, they're they're. If you're just playing your twip on a podcast player, they're not there. However, if you go to microbe.tv/slash twip, however, in the podcast player, they do some of them show the show notes. Do it, and you can click on the email on the mail ah. link, and you can get it there, and you'll see his his chart. Or go to microbe.tv slash twip and you'll look for episode 170 in the in the links. It says letters read on twip 170. You click that and you'll get to the chart. Wow. It's a very cool chart, Dixon, which yes, you didn't is. read, but it's it's the, no, it's well, the I, table from a book, anatomic location of the eye, clinical manifestation, and infectious organ, organism. Right. Very interesting. Right. So uh, let me just get this straight then, Daniel, if we're allowed to ask a few questions. Um, this is on the outside of the cornea. Um, I'm not going to answer. I'm just going to, you got what you got. You can ask got other questions. got what we got. <laughs> it says calcium on the cornea. On the cornea. It says calcium. on the cornea. Calcium. And outer the- retinal punctate lesions, which outer- is not the cornea. That's no, the it's not. That's the retina. Yeah. You got it? I do. You know what it is? I do now. <laughs> cool. No, no, I don't. No, you don't know? No, no, I'm not going to make any guesses right, right now. Let's read. Yeah, you're just, not allowed to guess yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> you gotta just a couple of emails, okay? Sure. Anthony sends a link to a paper in PLOS Neglected Tropical Diseases. Ticks as potential vectors of mycobacterium leprae. That's, oh. I remember that paper. I, I read that. That was a fun paper. Can ticks carry leprosy from wild animals to humans? They show that artificially infected female KN ticks are able to transmit the bacillus to their offspring, oh my which can then transmit it to rabbits. Eek. But rabbits are not people. No, they're not. <laughs> so, <laughs> Neither are ferrets. The last I knew. <laughs> ferrets are not humans. No. I wonder if there are any ticks that bite uh, armadillos. And then Anthony <laughs> says, uh, perhaps an arbovector is relevant to leprosy in New York City, sends a link to an article the molecular origin of endemic leprosy in New York City. We report mm. an indigenous case of leprosy in New York City. This is 2008. In an immunocompetent patient who was infected with M. leprae, genotype consistent with an exogenous origin. Physicians in the eastern U.S. should be alerted that almost all, most, although most patients who develop leprosy in the U.S. are foreign-born, 
Native-born Americans are also susceptible to the infection. Of course. wonder what the travel history but of that patient was. He was uh, <laughs> born in the Bronx. No history of travel outside the U.S. Yeah, well. And why he presented to the NYU Medicine Dermatology Clinic. I'll be you know, this could have been Daniel doing this. Could have been. <laughs> a what have, should have, could have. <laughs> Very interesting. Yeah, when I was when I was training at Bellevue, we actually had a whole leprosy wart, yeah. um, and most of the patients uh, were had not acquired here from the Philippines at that time. Um, but there's the big uh, leprosy uh, place down in Louisiana. There's a That's right. leprosy focus on one of the Hawaiian islands. Yes, and very uh, famous one. Yeah, still a lot of uh, areas. India has a large um, lots they have population. Lots. They have lots. Dixon. Uh, Dene writes, uh, hello, Vincent and Dick. Sorry <laughs> about that, Daniel. <laughs> What's left <out? laughs> First of all, I want to say thank you for your effort and also for sharing your knowledge with others. I'm hooked on your show. I'm a veterinary technology student in Houston, Texas, looking to get my license in veterinary technology and later specialize in lab work. I have a vast interest in parasitism. In my program, we typically focus on parasites that affect all kinds of animals and wildlife, as well as zoonotics as a public safety concern. I would love to hear your views and ideas on parasitism from a veterinary standpoint. And also, would you ever consider doing a few episodes specifically on canines, felines, farm animals, and zoonotics, and penguins? You didn't say in penguins, but we did one on penguins once. Uh, yeah, sure, we would love to do some more on that. In fact... Uh, the one we just did was uh, one of those, one canines and uh, felines. So thanks again, and uh, Danny. Yeah, we we could do some, right? Sure, we we just did one. We had a case. Uh, covered a paper. Ah, uh, we can do a paper. Daniel, uh, this next one from Kevin was <laughs> gotten in late, but I think it's very poetic. So would you mind reading it? Oh. I will go ahead. Kevin writes, entry received late, the <laughs> lair of the white worm, Mise and scene, a peaceful nursery school, morning light filtering into a well-ordered classroom, suffused with cleanliness and safety. At a stroke, all is upended. Birth from an unspeakable portal is a half-foot-long, etiolated worm, utterly incomprehensible in this world of innocence. We live in a state of ever-expanding security services, complete with gallons of dispensers of hand sanitizer wherever we turn. Into the context of such illusory order plops a sluggish six-inch worm. I think this is like a case back. <laughs> is this an exorcism? The teachers are divided. Do we call a priest or a doctor? They decide to phone the host's mother. For the past year, the stricken child has lived with his parents in a low-resource, non-industrialized nation. He was treated with single-dose albendazole before returns to the U.S. and has been home for three months. Of course, the single pill was perceived as 100% effective. <laughs> Would you expect less in this era of personalized medicine and pharmacologic triumphalism? <laughs> this case, in spite of its superficial resemblance to a straightforward clinical parasitology problem, is actually burdened with a potential psychic and emotional overlay. Here, we have a worm that is more than a worm, in spite of Freud's apocryphal quote, <laughs> sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. <laughs> more to the point, <laughs> didn't realize Dana he was the one who said that. <laughs> 1954 hit, Big Long Sliding Thing. Clearly refers to a musical instrument, but may leave room for broader interpretation song written by Kickland and Thomas, which brings us back around to that worm writhing on the nursery school floor. Is it more than just a humble Ascaris Lumbercoides, completely <laughs> innocent and incapable of disease transmission? I will argue that our worm is a stand-in for primitive fears of contagion, pollution, bodily penetration, and defilement. The most likely reaction that this case elicits in the uninitiated is disgust. This is a complex feeling or set of behaviors. Disgust status as an emotion is still debated. That is triggered by components of our own bodies and a plethora of environmental cues. Valerie Curtis from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine specializes in the study of disgust right. and argues that it is an adaptive response protecting humans from infection. She also harnesses the disgust response in public health strategies. See references. <laughs> 
University of Michigan law professor William Miller's 1997 book, The Anatomy of Disgust. It's encyclopedic in his examination of disgust. His following quotation is of relevance for us, but when our inside is understood as vile jelly, viscous ooze, or storage area for excrement, the orifices become dangerous as points of emission of polluting matter, dangerous both to us and to others. The nursery school staff in our case have been exposed to a swirl of disgust, excretion, anality, and a foul mucus covered invertebrate. We might as well throw ophidiophobia into the mix too. Pace Dr. Curtis, there is really no significant threat of infection here. It takes two to four weeks of soil incubation for Ascaris eggs to become infectious. There is the possibility that the toddler harbors other parasites, such as enterobius or strongyloides, but simple hand washing and common sense cleanup of the discharged worm would suffice. <laughs> Though this nursery school emergency is more aesthetic than medical, it doubtlessly inspired a janitorial scorched earth policy. Of course, there's no reason to remove the child from school, something that probably exacerbated the stigmatization surrounding the mishap. The difficulty of complete sanitization is suggested in PD6, where the expression filthy lucre is embodied by the fact that Ascaris eggs have been recovered from money, from currency. <laughs> Mommy is vindicated in her oft-repeated injunctions about putting money in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> the old saw that there's no such thing as a clean bill of health applies. <laughs> case. Though our returning family felt good about their albendazole treatment, there is... There was no discussion about cure rates or egg reduction rates in the region of their missionary work. The benzimidazoles, discovered in the 1960s, albendazole and mabendazole, are a significant improvement over earlier, more toxic vermifuges, for example, oil of chemopodium. <laughs> However, widespread various of benzimidazoles have led to a significant resistance in livestock. True. Resistance is less frequent in humans, but is well documented. Mm -hmm. Though cure rates and effective egg reduction rates are in the upper 90% range for Ascaris, treatment failures are not rare. Multiple studies outlining efficacy and treatment failures are in the endnotes. Some treatment failures have been ascribed to locally produced benzimidazoles, which may be improperly synthesized, adulterated, or incorrectly compounded. Mm -hmm. Also, as stated in PD6, children have much higher worm burns than adults, a consideration in single-dose treatment failure. In the era of mass administration of benzimidazole used in attempts to mitigate or eradicate soil-transmitted helminth transmission-resistant human need nematodes are expected to increase in frequency. Our patient, and probably the family, needs retreatment with a benzimidazole, and it would be prudent to examine his stool post-treatment to demonstrate absence of Ascaris eggs and document absence of other soil-transmitted helminths. The school staff needs reassurance and a primer on helminth biology and the negligible risk of contagion in this case. Gratitude to the twiplets who have admirably <laughs> high disgust thresholds. Twiplets. we twiplets. twiplets. I love it. <laughs> And then there follows End Notes and a Terminal Curiosity, which I encourage everyone to read because they are wonderful. <laughs> In particular, there is a section entitled Pseudo Literary Filler, <laughs> including The Lair of the White Worm, uh, which is uh, the title of his little piece here. And then he has Notes and References on Disgust. Dixon, what's worse than biting into an apple and finding a worm? Finding a half of a worm. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that great? Yep. Uh, Miller weighs in on the anus. Yet more than any other orifice, <laughs> it is the gate that protects the inviolability, the autonomy of males and indir indirectly of females too. Only feces and gas are to pass through. This fact makes it indelibly the lowest status place in the body rendered disgusting by feces and buffoonish and comical by gas. He goes on. It's wonderful. <laughs> All about disgust. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, listeners. That is TWIP 170. Indeed. Gentlemen, we are making our way to TWIP number 200. Well, it's going to be another year before we get there, I guess, right? We could. A little, probably a little more with our like bi weekly couple of months. That's still. Yeah. So. Well, maybe in 2020 we'll hit 200 and we'll have to do something. We will. As opposed to what we're doing now. Which is nothing, right? 
You, no, I'm, if, try, I'm trying to set up like a Parasites Without Borders continuing medical education yearly program in Ghana, Africa. So mm-hmm. maybe if timing works out, we'll be hanging out there. We could go to Ghana. Ghana. Wow. Yeah. I'd go to Ghana. I'd love to go to Ghana. Can we record there? We definitely, we definitely can. Okay. Absolutely. Then we'll go. Yeah, no, Accra, the, the capital of Ghana, is actually a uh, pretty pretty advanced, very nice uh, city. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, Have you been, Dixon? Yeah, but Daniel, you've been, right? So we'll have to look at that as a potential recording you've, site. You've been, right, Daniel, to yep. Ghana. Okay. Yep. All right, TWIP, you can listen to on a podcast player. Please subscribe. It's free. You get every episode, and we know how many people are listening. We'd really like you to subscribe. Tell your friends to subscribe, okay? If you... Uh, like what we do, consider supporting us financially. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute for a variety of ways you can do that. You could give us a dollar a month and you get all these podcasts for free, Twip, Twim, Twiv, Twivo, and Immune. A ton of podcasts a month for a buck. It's better than a cup of coffee. There you go. And if you want to ask questions or participate in the case histories, Twip at microbe.tv. Daniel Griffin's at Columbia University, Irving Medical Center, and ParasitesWithoutBorders.com, where you can find the downloads for PD7. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, a pleasure as always. Dixon de Pommier is at Trichinella.org and TheLivingRiver.org. Thank you, Dixon. It was fun. Did you learn something? Sure. I, <laughs> I always do. I did. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at Virology.ws. Thanks to Ronald Jenkins for the music, which is what you hear on TWIP. And I want to thank ASM for their support. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIP is is parasitic. parasitic.